favor, close your eyes for a moment. Now imagine, you can open your eyes. Imagine you're on the deck of the Starship Enterprise approaching Earth for the first time, and you see this beautiful blue marble. And Captain Kirk says, Mr. Spock, is there any life down there? The first sign of life you would see on this planet are these beautiful rings in the ocean, coral reefs, coral atolls. They are the largest, oldest, most productive structures that are living on the planet. And then as the Enterprise slipped around the dark side, you would see the signs of civilization of all these people trying to ward off the darkness with their lights. And if you drop down into the city, you'd feel that buzz, that buzz you get when you go to a major city like New York or Paris or Hong Kong or um, London, you know? It's, cities are incredible collections of people and, and they really are cultural centers and are innovative centers and that's where things happen with humans. And if you dropped underwater and went to one of these atolls and visited a coral reef, the exact same thing would be happening. Everybody down there is busy. Everybody has a little job to do. Everybody's running away from something bigger that might eat it. These are the oldest, as well as the, the largest structures built on Earth. They're the oldest ecosystems on the planet. They date back 240 million years, at least. And their ancestors date back to 500 million years, these old bioherms. So they are the oldest, most productive, most biodiverse systems on the planet. And you might say, well, why should we care? Well, they feed about a billion people. They protect our coastlines from big storm waves. They provide the biodiversity for future pharmaceuticals. Most of all, they provide what we think of as environmental security on the, in the planet. These are an integral part of, of humans. And they're also the highest expression of life in the sea. 30 out of 34 phylum of animals touch reefs during their lifespan. But all the different phyla of plants are found on reefs as well, in and out of them, or associated with them. So these are like the epicenter of life on our planet. Now in the last 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, we've seen an increase in the human population. It's doubled since I began studying coral reefs. And this has sort of sparked the rise of what we call megacities. These are cities of over 10 million population. At the same time, coral reefs, starting in 1975, if we say, well, what did this reef, Carries Fort Reef, look like um, now? Looks like this. Dancing Lady Reef in Jamaica, the, one of the most well-developed reefs in all the Caribbean. It was the center of the Discovery Bay Marine Lab, which was um, started coral reef science, modern science. And Dancing Lady in 1972 looked like this and in 2013 looked like this 40 years later. The magical island of Bali, a reef that we call Symphony Reef because it's so beautiful. And when you dive there, the whole reef is playing a symphony. The fish, the corals, all the invertebrates, it's just a magical place, 2014. Fast forward three years, yeah. Looks like a war zone, it's an underwater war zone. Most of us don't realize that because it's underwater. We watch the sunset on the water, we have a margarita, all's well with the world, it's a beautiful world. We don't realize what's been happening underwater is the same thing as what's been happening in our cities. It's like people have been going to these cities, these underwater cities, and just ravaging them. And the question is, why? How are people dealing with this? So to begin the story, I want to tell you a little bit about the biology of reefs and the geology of reefs. Reefs are a collaboration between biological and physical forcing functions to grow underwater mountains made out of a rock called calcium carbonate. And in the center of this photograph, you can see a coral skeleton that's growing outwards. That coral grew for about 800 years. This is a reef in Key Largo when, about 100,000 years ago when sea level was quite a bit higher than it is today. So this is a reef that formed in situ. Reefs develop to their highest expression in the middle of the tropical ocean, where the water visibility at 200 feet in any direction, there are almost no nutrients in the water, there's no sediment in the water, there's lots and lots of sunlight, and there's lots of wave energy, but the question is, how do these incredible ecosystems basically exist in the middle of a desert? And that's their key, the, the adaptations that have evolved in this last 200 million years or so, that have resulted in these incredible ecosystems also make them vulnerable to humans. 
And we have to realize that. We have to begin to learn that. Remember, I've said these are the largest structures on Earth. The key are the corals that grow. And these corals are small animals. An individual polyp in this picture is somewhere between the size of your thumb and the size of your pinky. These are little animals. They're voracious carnivores. They open up at night and they feed on plankton. And that's where they get their nutrients, the phosphates and the nitrates that they need. They're sort of like the roots of, of plants, but they're, the roots, they're animals acting as roots sticking into the water. In the daytime, they collapse, they withdraw, and we see this yellow-brown surface. And the yellow-brown color are microscopic algae that live in their tissues. So these microscopic algae are sitting there being plants inside the animals. And there's actually as much or more plant material on a reef as there is animal material on a reef. So corals are animals and plants in one symbiosis. They recycle all the materials that come in. And the photosynthesis, which you can see here as the fluorescence that escapes a naturally photosynthesizing coral, is everywhere on the surface. This is what drives the growth rate of the coral skeleton. And all of this occurs in three cell layers thick, about the thickness of a dollar bill. So corals, even though they get huge, and some of them get you know, as big as your SUVs, are a surface phenomenon. So if you scratch their surface, there's just rock beneath it. It's not like me. If I scratch myself, my body will heal it. But a coral doesn't do that. It has to grow back in from the sides. So they're very vulnerable to things that happen on their surface. Now, humans come along, and we do three basic things. We take stuff, we break stuff, we pollute stuff. Okay? We take stuff out of the sea. And you have to realize that this is sort of a local thing. Fishermen go out, and they take animals out of the sea. We collect shells. We sell them, we glean the reef. There are people that go out and just glean the reef. An individual taking these shells, selling them to tourists. It's a form of income. People go diving and snorkeling on reefs, and when they do that, they step on the reefs. Or sometimes they go sailing on the reefs, by mistake. And there's no way that a coral that can stand up to a 10-foot wave or even a 15-foot wave can stand up to the forces exerted by a 5,000-pound sailboat keel or a diver that just stamps on the reef. They're just not adapted to that. They're adapted to the ocean. We also like to live around reefs. So in places like the Florida Keys, we go into the mangrove areas. We dredge them out. We make um, beautiful areas where we can plant houses, and we can have a boat slip right next to it. And every single one of those houses has a septic tank. And every single one of those septic tanks collects waste that's rich in nutrients, and those nutrients leach out into the nearby sea. And when they do that, the algae grow, because the algae are better at absorbing large amounts of nutrients than the corals are. So the reef becomes overgrown with algae. It also, because we have microbes in our guts, those microbes go out and actually see the coral as something delicious to eat. And so we have what we call coral diseases. This one's called the white plague. And these diseases can kill 500-year-old corals in a matter of months. We also put a lot of stuff in the atmosphere. We burn coal. We burn other fossil fuels. We put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And we dump a lot of stuff into the oceans. For years, we, the solution to pollution is dilution, right? So we just dump it in the ocean and see what happens. All of that, when you dump something in the water, it's going to connect somewhere else in the ocean. These little red dots, every single one of these red dots happens to be a river mouth that's polluted. And that, if you put pollution in the ocean, it's going to travel around the world in the ocean currents. So everywhere is everywhere. The amount of heat that the Earth has absorbed in the last 40, 50 years has been principally absorbed by the oceans. The oceans have absorbed somewhere between 80 and 90% of that extra heat load. When the ocean gets too hot, the corals bleach. What happens is the zooxanthellae, these algae that are so good for the corals, start producing too much oxygen. They become toxic. And the animal says, get out. You're toxic. Sort of like you losing a kidney. And when you dive on a reef that's bleached, where these mass bleachings are, it's just a bad feeling when you dive on these reefs. If it gets too hot, the corals will die. So we have to ask ourselves, can we imagine a world without coral reefs? Can we imagine that? Can we let that happen? Well, the answer might be we don't want to let it happen. And there's a way that we can deal with it. We're all connected by the water cycle. 
When it rains here, that water probably comes from the ocean. The ocean begins at your front door. You walk out your door on a rainy day or anything you drop on the ground actually floods into the sea eventually. So the ocean begins at your front door. Be careful. It's also that ecology is local. Think about all this debris we see on a beach in Bali. Every single one of these cups was handled by at least three people. People, all right? Somebody made it, somebody sold it, somebody used it and dropped it on the beach. So ecology is really local. It begins with every single one of us. We believe in conservation through participation. We believe that people should begin to get busy and put their hands to work and do things. Do things in your front yard, do things on your beach, or do things in the ocean, like this large net we were taking off here. Ed Ricketts, who was the doc in Cannery Row, is a good friend of John Steinbeck's, wrote an essay called On Participation and Breaking Through, in which he said, when people work together to solve problems, they can bang their head against a wall for a long time, and then they break through and they realize, hey, I can do something. And what we've found, that breaking through gives you an endorphin squirt. It gives you a rush. It gives you a good feeling. It's like the birth struggle followed by joy. And when we get people to do things like that, they become ardent conservationists, and they realize, I can make a difference myself. Cousteau wrote an essay a long time ago called The Long Term Has No Price, in which he argued that conservation is not something that we can trade off with economics. The goods and services of the planet were valued in 1997 at $33 trillion, more than all the economies of all the world's nations put together. $33 trillion. The oxygen we breathe, the water we get, the fish we get, and on and on and on. But if I took $33 trillion and went to the best universities on the planet and said, hey guys, here's a great grant, here's $33 trillion, make me a biosphere, we wouldn't even have the faintest idea of how to go about doing that. So what we need to do is keep what we have. So when someone says, I'm sorry, but we can't have that marsh where those birds breed because it's not economically feasible to save it, the answer is, I'm sorry, it's too expensive to lose, okay? So what I've tried to show you here is the threats to reefs are the result of their adaptations to a world without humans. Humans come along and we provide all of these various stressors that are becoming aggregated. The stress begins locally with a person who catches a fish or a person who steps on a coral or a person who throws a cigarette out of a car or a person who, who uses too much water or whatever you can think of. And you guys are smart. You have a lot of those things that you've done, your overconsumption. That scales up to regional issues and it scales up to global issues. But it starts with individuals, individuals participating. Right? A journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. So maybe we all need to reduce our ecological footprints on this planet, and maybe, just maybe, if we all get together and do that, maybe all those little steps can start a stampede, and we can save the planet. Thank you.